The third speaker in this session is Professor Gillian Metzger from the, the Columbia University School of Law. Professor Metzger is the faculty director of the Center for Constitutional Governance at Columbia Law School. Professor, Mez Professor Metzger is a, an international recognized researcher in the fields of constitutional law and administrative law. She has done extensive work on the legal aspects of privatization and has uh, published important research studies in the most prestigious and important professional journals. The subject of Professor Metzger's lecture is private delegation, due process, and the duty to supervise. Please welcome. Um, uh, uh, hello. I'm no. Okay, well, I am actually, the slides don't become relevant until a few minutes, so hopefully they'll catch up to me. Um, thank you. I'm delighted to be here um, uh, and enjoying the, the conference and the day very much. Um, what I wanted to talk about was uh, the regulation of privatization, particularly in the contracting out form of privatization, um, the use of contracts with private entities to provide governmental services, to implement governmental programs. Um, uh, and it's the, the reason why I want to focus on these is the reason in part that just mentioned, which is the, the, um, the central dynamic that you see in this kind of public co contract is that they involve a, government, a delegation of governmental power into private hands. Um, through the contracts, the government is essentially authorizing private entities to act on its behalf and in the process to exercise authority over third parties. Um, government contracts of this kind are ubiquitous. Um, in Israel, <laughs> but certainly in the United States and I think in many, many countries around the globe. Um, uh, just to give you a sense, so the, uh, the Federal um, uh, Office of Management and Budget, um, just at the federal budget, um, estimated $320 billion um, a year in fiscal 2010. Um, in this kind of federal service contracting. That's just federal, that doesn't include the states, which is many, many, many hundreds of billions more. Um, what's fascinating to me is that despite this uh, ubiquity um, and the fact that it is a, uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> Not yet. No, okay, we're getting there. Um, uh, and, and, the, and the degree to which uh, contemporary governance really depends on privatization, we still lack a coherent legal framework um, under which we should be assessing this kind of government uh, contracting. Um, and I think that reflects in part a deep ambivalence um, uh, and inconsistent the, over whether we should treat this kind of government contracting through a private law framework or through a public law framework. Um, so what I want to do today is first just give a brief overview of some of the inconsistencies and incoherence in the United States approach, particularly that of the Supreme Court, um, and then talk a little bit, if I have time, um, about what the appropriate legal framework might be. Um, I, just to, to hit the bottom line, in case I don't get there um, time-wise, uh, I do think that uh, a public law framework um, is critical, um, but neither just a traditional public law nor a traditional private law lens alone will suffice. Um, and instead, I think you need a, an analysis that encompasses both. Um, uh, and uh, the solution for that that I think has promise is one that centers on delegation and supervision. Um, uh, we're waiting. We're waiting. Okay. Um, I, all right, so I'm going to start with the current incoherence. Um, and the best way to get this coherent incoherence, I think, is to contrast several of the United States Supreme Court's decisions that involve prison contracting. Um, uh, and uh, they not only show the confusion in the U.S., but I think they're a nice contrast to the academic uh, center decision. Um, so in the U.S., rather than uh, addressing this through whether or not you can privatize through constitutional rights to, to personal liberty and dignity, um, the analytic move, the first analytic move that proves critical is one that actually uh, Rick mentioned, which has to do with state action, finding whether or not um, those private corporations that are running uh, prisons and their employees are state actors. Um, now, in general, in the United States, most instances of privatization, you don't find state action. The threshold for finding state action has gone incredibly high. Um, but prisons is one of the contexts in which you do. Um, and you have found state action. Um, and this matters tremendously because it's the underlying trigger, since our Constitution only applies to state actors, it's the underlying trigger to have constitutional rights and protections apply at all. Um, uh, and uh, 
in the in the process of after although there's agreement on finding state action that's pretty much where the consistency ends um, and you see a lot of variation in the Supreme Court's um, decisions in terms of how it portrays contracting out and the similarities and differences um, it sees between private and public uh, prisons okay um, well I would have a slide up but maybe we'll get one eventually by the time I'm done so you don't have to remember all that I'm saying um, and I want to contrast three decisions here uh, one's called Richardson versus McKnight um, one's called Correctional Services Corporation versus Malesko, and one's called Minichi versus Pollard. Um, all of these come out of the, the, the context of private prisons. Um, Richardson, which was the first one, involved a suit by an inmate at a state prison against the guards that were hired by the private corporation that ran the prison. Um, and it was a case that actually involved the question of whether or not there should be um, qualified immunity whether or not the guards, when they were being sued for constitutional violations, could claim a qualified immunity. Um, now, the key thing here is if they had been employed by a public prison, they would have had qualified immunity. That was pretty well established. Um, uh, and so then the question was, well, they're doing the same job for a private prison corporation. Should they still get qualified immunity? Um, and the court says no. Uh, and it says no because it concludes that the prison corporations that are running the prison are highly efficient firms operating in a competitive marketplace with the flexibility to structure their employment relations to ensure that um, the, their employees act vigorously and to take into account um, also the constitutional concerns and to avoid the high liability verdicts that might result. So the very fact that these were private corporations contracting out, operating in a market, is enough to mean that you don't need qualified immunity to ensure that they'll do their jobs vigorously um, and to protect against excessive costs. Um, that is Richardson, right? Um, Malesko involves a very similar fact situation. It's a, it's, in this case, it's a suit against uh, a private prison corporation, which is one difference, um, operating a federal prison. Um, uh, and it was also a suit against the guards, but that part got dropped out. So at the end, when it's before the court, it's just the suit against the private corporation. Um, uh, and one difference between this case and uh, the earlier case I mentioned, it also has to do with the basis of suit. Because it's against federal officials, it has to be an implied right of action as opposed to a statutory right. All right, we're coming. <laughs> OK. Um, I, and uh, so you had these two differences. One is that it's against a federal prison. One is that uh, it's against the corporation that's running it. Um, uh, and according to the court, these differences made all the differences in the world. Um, and what the court emphasized here is not um, the differences between the private and the public, but rather it began with the proposition, had this action been brought against a public uh, agency operating a prison, you couldn't sue for damages. So since you couldn't sue the public corporation for damages, you shouldn't be able to sue the private corporation for damages when the private corporation is operating the prison. Um, so you can see right there the contrast with the first case I mentioned in terms of whether or not public and private makes a difference, whereas in the first case, it does make a difference. Hey, we're there, and we even one, one decision ahead. We jumped, good. Um, uh, so in the, in the original case, the Richardson case, um, the, the fact that it was a private, uh, privately run prison made all this difference. You could, uh, even though you couldn't recover against a public guard, you could recover against a private one. Here, the public agency, the private corporation, they're the same thing. No uh, recovery against either one. Um, and in addition, one of the reasons that the court gives is what we're really trying to do is engage in deterrence against individual guards. Thank you. Um, uh, and uh, suing the corporation isn't going to make any difference in getting deterrence against individual guards um, because it's the, the agency, the corporation, that's running the prison rather than the guard. Again, that's at odds with Richardson, which said that the corporation has the ability to take economic incentives into account to make sure there wouldn't be constitutional rights violations. So you have a real analytic uh, contrast between those two. The third, um, the most recent decision from 2012, uh, Minichi versus Pollard, um, reverts back to Richardson in drawing a distinction between private and public. Um, uh, uh, but it goes along with Malesko in saying that the effect of this difference is that there's no recovery uh, for a claim violation of constitutional rights. Um, so the facts in Minichi were uh, an amalgam of the first two. Um, it involved an action against a, a, a private prison guard at a federal prison, so it was the implied right. Um, uh, and it wasn't against the corporation. Um, uh, again, the court had held that if you're a prison guard at a publicly managed prison, you can be sued under this action 
um, and get damages against you. Um, I, I, then the question is whether or not you could be sued in Minichi um, when you are a private prison guard. Um, and the court says no. Um, now, you would have thought, uh, or you might have thought, that given the fact that this action had been recognized against uh, a public guard, um, given the emphasis in Malesko on the need to, to take your accountability against an individual official, right? given the reference in Richardson to the importance of damages in, as a means of protecting individual rights of inmates, um, that in fact the action would lie. Um, but the court says no, and why? Because of the difference between private and public. Um, and the court concludes there's no need to have this damage, implied damages action, because you could just sue in tort. You have private law remedies that are available to you. Um, uh, and you don't have uh, those private law remedies if you're suing a federal um, uh, official. Um, and therefore, this is a meaningful difference between public and private, OK? Um, so you have real inconsistencies, I think, between how to bring in the public and the private and how the court should analyze the liability frame. All of these involve constitutional suits. So this is all about public accountability. But how do we bring in public and private in thinking about how that should run? Um, now, to be fair, some of what's going on here has to do with very specific jurisdictional doctrines and a pullback in private rights of action, uh, which is a separate area of doctrine. Um, I don't actually think that's all that's driving it. I think that the Supreme Court is really quite puzzled by the task of how do we categorize privatization? How do we categorize these instances where we have uh, not something that is not wholly public and not wholly private? Um, uh, the, the private features, the fact that it's a private firm, that it's responding to the marketplace, that it's, that it's taking economic incentives into account, um, makes the private prisons seem different um, from publicly uh, run prisons. It makes it seem more like other instances of private firms where we expect the firms to be able to have a damages against action against them and take it into account and change how they behave, right? So that suggests we should have different frameworks. You go for private suit and tort, right, and respond to it superior, you'll get accountability, that's how we should run it. Um, on the other hand, it's quite clear this isn't just any private firm, right? This is an instance in which um, private firms are doing the work of government. They are exercising governmental power over others. Um, and if you look at the instances of public prison, you find the same kind of private relationship. An individual employee is contracting with the state to provide services as a prison guard, right? So if we have that kind of private contractual relationship in a public prison as well, why would we start pulling it apart? Um, and I think it leaves the, the court quite, quite puzzled um, uh, as to why it should matter that there's an intermediary corporation. How do we deal with this phenomenon of privatization? Now, um, uh, two factors that I, I just want to Um, uh, two factors that you could see as playing a particular role here. Um, uh, these both, uh, again, they come up in academic centers. I think they're quite, it's quite interesting the degree of parallel, um, that I, it, even though there's a very different sort of outcome and, and, and ultimate result. Um, one is, it, maybe it matters that we have this corporation because it's for profit, right? Um, uh, and the second is, it might matter because of this phenomenon of delegation uh, of government powers, that the, that the corporation is exercising these quintessentially governmental powers. Um, now, the for-profit factor, I think, is quite interesting here. It was actually raised below in the first case that I mentioned, the Richardson case. Um, and the Sixth Circuit, which was the court below, um, decided on the grounds that there shouldn't be qualified immunity because a private prison was more likely to violate individual constitutional rights. Um, one of the arguments that came up in Academic Center as well. Um, uh, the majority doesn't engage in this point at all. Right? Instead, talks about the purposes of qualified immunity under the traditional public approach not being applying. Um, Justice Scalia does engage this in dissent and says that that argument has it exactly backwards because we know private firms are so efficient they would never engage in more rights violation. Um, and as an empirical question, I think uh, there actually may be some real reasons for concern about the impact of the profit motor here on the operation of prisons. It's very complicated by the fact that public prisons um, uh, in the United States are in such dire straits that it's hard to, to, to say um, always that one is worse than the other. Um, uh, the more interesting point about for profit here, I think, is how does it work with our norms and culture about government service and about the provision of public service? Um, and that's where I think you start getting this tension. There's a recent book 
by um, a scholar at Yale, uh, Nick Perillo, um, where uh, he does, it's called Against the Profit Motive, and he studies the history of the development of governmental service and talks about how we moved in the United States from a fee for, uh, you could get a fee for an official to do something for you, the official could get a bounty, this kind of private monetary incentives for clearly governmental of officials to a, a, a opposition to that as the norms for public service. Um, uh, and now we have actually a real due process concern if governmental officials stand to gain from their decisions. Um, uh, and the interesting thing here is that actually we've had privatization in the United States for a very, very long time, and it's been quite extensive, certainly back um, to the, you know, the growth of the welfare state in the 1960s and provision social programs and, and even earlier with the New Deal. Um, uh, and, and the reason why it didn't spark the same degree of concern is because it was uh, not-for-profits that were mainly providing often the contracted services um, in, some, in some areas. Um, and it's the birth of for-profit contracting that I think has really triggered a lot of the concern with the profit motive. And it's also led some scholars to try and talk about how could we expand public norms? How do we use contract as a way of actually imposing public norms on private um, actors as a way of bridging this public-private divide? Um, uh, I want to actually focus more on the second explanation, the delegation aspects. Um, and th this just relates to this kind of structural question about whether or not delegations of governmental power are, are constitutional, um, whether some, some powers can't be delegated at all, and if they are delegated, what are the conditions under which they could be delegated? Um, again, this came up in Academic Center, um, uh, and the court didn't ultimately rule on this question of, of, uh, of delegation and whether it could be delegated. Um, uh, in the United States, um, challenges to, to dele private delegations have periodically arisen. Um, and they were actually one of the bases under which some of the early New Deal programs were invalidated, um, along with uh, 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 things like the commerce power and, and other restrictions. Um, as the Supreme Court accepted the modern administrative state after 1937, um, this private delegation doctrine became really quite toothless. Um, and it reduced to just a requirement that the government has to formally supervise, um, but no investigation of whether it was actually supervising. Um, uh, I'm going to skip uh, over this case, but this is an interesting case from this term, which actually involved Amtrak, a private corporation, um, and was the first signal recently that maybe the court may be interested in revising reviving some features of the private delegation doctrine um, in terms of the remand that it gave. Um, but instead of talking about that case, I want to talk about um, uh, the, the, how you could use delegation here. So I've argued um, in other work that you should use delegation to impose conditions that if the government wants to delegate um, power to private entities to exercise over third parties, it has to ensure that it does so subject to the conditions that will guarantee that constitutional rights and other legal protections will be honored. Um, and one of the key mechanisms for that um, is supervision. Um, uh, and um, uh, one of the, th the th reasons why I think supervision holds real uh, promise here is that it acknowledges that public and private are different. Um, it doesn't impose a categorical prohibition on governmental use of private actors, but it does require the government to structure its delegations and then oversee the powers that are wielded by its delega delegates um, to ensure that constitutional harms um, are not thereby incurred. Um, the degree of supervision and the form of supervision are going to depend a great deal on context. Um, there may be some context in which you can't supervise adequately enough and therefore you can't delegate. Um, and maybe some might think the prisons f uh, fall into that category. Um, uh, the, uh, there is some precedent in this constitution. There is that original private delegation doctrine which talked about formal supervision. Um, it is also a factor that the court flagged in Richardson and pulled out. It said, we're not going to talk about the cases where um, you might have uh, active governmental supervision, whether or not maybe qualified immunity could apply there. So you even see the court signaling recently that that might matter. Um, it's also present in private corporation law, where you're beginning to see in some uh, context, uh, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act is one that you can see this in, but also in some aspects of the business judgment rule, an emphasis on the duty to supervise within the company. So it's an interesting way of kind of bridging um, the, some pr public law doctrines um, and private law doctrines. Um, the other thing that I find appealing, and, and with this I'll, I'll close, is that I think that bringing up supervision and making it um, a kind of core focus is that it actually also um, has benefits when we think about public administration and public 
publicly run uh, programs and services. Um, uh, you know, so supervision is a core feature and a core concern of public administration. Um, uh, it does not get the attention, at least in the United States administrative law, um, that, it, that it deserves. It's something that we actually don't uh, engage with um, in either constitutional law when we're talking about public situations or really in administrative law. Um, instead, the focus is all on the immediate action being challenged and not what went behind it, not the scheme of supervision, not the scheme of governance. Um, one of the reasons to bring in supervision um, is both to make better sense, I think, of public administration and to create an, an analytic concept that allows you to see different forms of program implementation but with the same underlying norms taking the factors of those contexts into account in terms of how you actually apply the analysis, but also bringing in the idea of the responsibility to supervise and the idea of delegation of power and how that plays out um, in both public and private contexts um, and allowing greater uh, development of that concept to occur. Thank you very much.